Hello, I'm going to be showing you everything you need to know about requests to get started. So request is a crate for Rust that allows you to send requests and then also read responses. You can parse the bodies and read JSON or form data, all sorts of other things. You can add proxies to, you know, intercept your requests and then proxy it to a SOC server, HTTP server, HTTPS server, all sorts of stuff. And I'll also be showing you that too in this. You can use cookies. You can have a cookie jar, store cookies, persist cookies, all that sort of thing. We're showing you that. And you can also use it asynchronously or blocking and I'll be showing you that too. Let's get right into it. If you go to your crate that you're using a request, we need to pull it in in the cargo.toml. So you can see that I'm going to be using the blocking to show you that I'll be using cookies, I'll be using JSON, and I'll be using socks for the proxy. Then I'll be using Surde to actually parse JSON data from the server. Like let's say you get a JSON response and you want to read that into a Rust struct. You need Surde to do that. And then for our async runtime, I'm using Tokyo. Okay, so let's jump into our main.rs. I've created a list of functions that show you all the basics that you need to know for requests. First thing is, let's say you're not using an async runtime. You can tell because there's no async keyword right here. Unlike if you look here where this is an async main, you can see we set up Tokyo main, but here it's just plain Rust. So for that, we actually need to use the request blocking. So to do that, then we do request blocking get, we can get the response from that, and then we can read the response into a body, then we print the body. Notice how there's no awaits or anything here, it's just plain. So if we actually want to run that, I have this test server that you can see the request and all the headers and everything else, and then you can see the body that's returned from the server. So here you can see the body that's been returned and we awaited the text, or we didn't await the text, we just got it plain. But let's say you do want to use the await keyword and have an asynchronous runtime. Then to do that, let's just comment out this stuff and let's uncomment this. Okay, here I set up Tokyo, I have async uh, for the main and all that sort of stuff. Then let's say you have a section of your code that is blocking. So if you want to have, if you want to re use request blocking with Tokyo, then you'll need to spawn blocking and then create a Lambda or whatever these functions are called in Rust, I forgot, I'm blanking on it. But anyways, you need to create that and then move the function and get the result in here. So it's, it'll just return the exact same thing as we had before. Now let's say you want to use await. Then you'll just use request get, see how we're not using the blocking namespace anymore. We're just using it plain. Then we also need to await this request. And then we also need to wait the text while it's parsing. Then we can just get the body like normal. So if we run that, it should return the same result. Very nice. So continuing later, right along. Now let's say you get a JSON response from the server and you want to read that into a Rust struct. Then to do that, you'll have your struct and then you need to derive deserialize, which we get from Surde up here as that uh, trait and that macro. We do our request like normal, we await it. Then we're at, when we're actually parsing the request to get the response, or parsing the response to get the data, I should say, then we just pass the data struct as a generic type into this JSON function. Then we await while it parses, and then we can print out body.test. So if we look at what this returns, it should return like works. See how up here it's test to works, and our struct it's test to string. This loads that test string value into that test of our struct, then we read it right here. So that's how you read JSON data from the server. Let's say you want to post something to the server. Be showing you several things, but this get, this is just a basic thing on the, it's just a function on the request namespace. But for the posting, you'll have to set up a client, which allows you to do more advanced things when you're actually sending a request. In this case, we say we want to use the post method to the normal URL, but let's also send a content length that is the length of our body down here that we're also sending. And then you can also do more advanced things like set a timeout. So wait only five seconds before timing out if the server doesn't respond. Then we wait while this client is built. Then we just await like normal the body, get the body and print it out. So this should post now to the server. And you can see the server prints out the body down here. Okay, perfect. That's how you post to a server. 
So moving along, let's say you want to read your response that you get from the server. So in that case that we just did that post, the server returned a 200, which is just a status code saying everything went okay. To do that, let's see right here, we post, we wait for it to send, we get the response back, then we match on the status. And request has a list of status codes like okay. You know, anything than 200, like 204, that's still fine. That's still a fine error code. So that will match okay right here. And there's also like forbidden and all sorts of things. You can just look in this namespace right here if you want to see all of them. But in this case, it should just return everything went okay. So in this case, yeah, status okay, perfect. Now, let's say you have, you want to do something more advanced with the request. Like let's say you have a request struct and you have some sort of builder in your application that you want to use and pass a request struct all over your application before it finally bounces out into actually making the request. Well, in this case, that would be, it'd be useful to have a request struct that you then use that is part of your application. So here you can see we generate a request from the request struct by giving it a method and then also a URL. But let's say somewhere in your application, it's there's a conditional URL. In our case, we put 8001, which is the incorrect port our correct port is 8000. So we'll want to change it. To do that, we can just get the request, get the URL as immutable, and then we can print out the current port. So that should be 8001. Then we set the port to 8000. Then we print it out again, and then we just execute it like normal. And this is what you have to do when you actually build your own request is do client.execute request and then await as usual, then print out the body. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Perfect, so it says 8,001, then 8,000, and then prints out the body like normal because it's able to be successfully made since we use the right port. Okay, so that's using the request struct. Then let's say you want to persist cookies. Like let's say you have some sort of cookie authentication that stores a session and you want to persist that across your application. To do that, you're gonna need a cookie jar so you can see we build a default cookie jar up here. Then the cookie store, which is what is set on the client builder, that needs to be an arc. So this should be Tokyo, but I'm using, I accidentally used the wrong one. It doesn't really matter. Or I guess it does matter, but for this case, it doesn't. Okay, so then we set cookie store to true, meaning it will persist the cookies across multiple requests. Then we set our cookie provider, we clone this arc and then set the store. This should actually be mutable too. But you know, in production, that's what you would implement, a mutable arc. And then, or you know, the arc contains a mutable, I should say. Okay, then we clone, give it that cookie store. Then we do the request like normal. Now the server can actually send back a cookie. Then we'll set that on the cookie jar and we can access it later in our application by doing like jar.get uh, or jar.cookies. Yeah, something like that and then like pass in the url and then like get cookie or something like that you can look on the jar let's just look at this real quick okay so jar so you can add a cookie string and then you can set cookies you can get cookies right here too and then on the header value you might have to parse it yourself that's something to consider when you're using cookies is the cookie jar you can actually parse it they have a cookie struct this is getting little deep but yeah so you could like parse the headers and then read them into cookie structs that's one option too but if you look at this one we sh we also send a cookie as the header as the test value and here you can see our cookie header is equal to test okay so that's cookies and requests now let's say you want to proxy a request so in this case I set the proxy value to build a proxy proxy all methods and then are all like HTTP, HTTPS, all that sort of stuff. And then we're using a SOX5 and then we're connecting to my Tor proxy that's running. And we get the client, then we're doing a request to the check on the Tor project to see if it's valid. And then if it is, we print out the text that we get back from the Tor project. So we run this, it should print out all this stuff saying this browser is configured to use Tor and it prints out this IP address, which is not my own IP. It is working, it is proxying through Tor. 
Okay, that is proxying and everything pretty much basic they need to know about requests. And I encourage you to look at the docs RS. I'll leave this in the description. You know, do a search like, I don't know what you want to use. Let's say you want to use proxy. Then just search proxy. Let's say you have a URL that you don't want to proxy. Then read through the no proxy and see how this works. You can also search on GitHub and see how other people are using this. Something I like to do too. So that is a pretty quick, you know, overview how to use request. Thank you for watching.